so we're going to uh, begin now. It's 2.30. Uh, I'm Bill Lozonic. I'm chairing this session and giving the initial presentation, which will try to set some of the themes for our discussion. Uh, then we'll uh, have presentations in uh, the order people are seated, at, seated here, Antonia Andrioni, Marie Cantor, Steve Denning, and Matilde Desnar. Uh, and we'll uh, make every attempt to keep plenty of time for discussion uh, with a uh, small but uh, I'm sure very informed audience. Okay, so i um, going to talk about uh, the title of uh, this, this uh, session on corporate resource allocation, financialization. And I looked in, uh, in Adam Smith uh, for, uh, of course, it's famous for the use of the term of invisible hand. And, Actually, interesting enough, in theory of moral sentiments, when he uses it, it's not really about uh, the invisible hand of the market at all. It's about a tight-knit agrarian society. I won't bother reading the whole thing. Uh, where uh, even though he says that uh, the uh, the rulers are the people on top are uh, uh, natural selfishness or opacity, nevertheless they see it in their interests of. Uh, their employees, the people who work on the land, of having enough uh, of a share, a share of the produce uh, so that uh, they have a, a reasonable standard of living. And, and so that uh, the, and the close-knit agricultural society uh, uh, yields, has the social norms that give you an equitable income distribution or somewhat equitable. And uh, of course that's a far Cry, uh, obviously, from uh, where we are now, or even where Adam Smith was a little later when he started uh, seeing the eve of the Industrial Revolution. Um, now, uh, in terms of the moral, what I might call moral sentiments for the 21st century, uh, I like to talk about three things, uh, economic growth that's stable and equitable. Uh, I call it, he's been calling it for some time, sustainable prosperity. Okay, so we want the growth to ha have the potential of higher standards of living. Uh, we want it to be stable because people need to have decent incomes over now, if given longevity, let's say four decades, retirement income, two or even three decades. Uh, and it should be equitable, shared uh, equitably among those who contributed to it, including across generations. And of course, this is where, on the equitable part, uh, you have a lot of social norms entering in. Um, if you take the United States, it's far from stable and equitable growth. It's uh, highly inequitable, uh, unstable employment, and sagging productivity. And that's even when you start getting uh, a boom that lasts for, for, for a long period of time. Um, this is a, a graph from the New York Times which shows for 34-year periods, first from 1946 to 1980, the gray line uh, for uh, uh, Get changes in income uh, over this period by percentile from the lowest to the highest. And you can see that the lowest uh, percentile got more of the gains than, than the highest over that 34-year period, just the opposite from 1980 uh, uh, to uh, 2014, uh, extreme income inequality. Okay. Now, um, the other place where Adam Smith talks about uh, the invisible hand is in the Wealth of Nations where he's talking about uh, really investment in productive capabilities, which is uh, the main theme of what uh, at least I'm going to talk about and I think many other people are going to talk about here. Uh, and here, this is the more famous quote of where he says of invisible hand, of directing that industry in such a manner as, produce it may be, uh, as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain, etc. So this is the free market allocated resources, but I kind of, at one point, teaching this stuff, that well, produce may be of the greatest value. How does that happen? Well, that's not the free market. Someone has to invest in productive capabilities. And so that's the question you need to ask. And in fact, Adam Smith himself started off with the notion of a pin factory and how you get productivity. A pin factory, which he said, is a kind of a trifling manufacturer. So let's just look at this, but you know, other stuff's more complicated. So that's really what we need to look at, is how you invest in productive capabilities. And uh, the way I've been looking at it from a societal point of view is that we have kind of three types of organizations that invest in productive capabilities, household, governments, and businesses. Um, and households investing in the future labor force, governments investing in, in uh, infrastructure and society's knowledge base, 
and then innovative enterprises further developing productive resources through value creating process to get uh, innovation, which I define as a higher quality product at a lower unit cost. So that's the productivity challenge. Now if you take uh, the uh, um, data on firms in the United States, uh, big firms are a big part of this, this process. So you have just over 2,000, 2,100 firms, uh, 5,000 or more employees, averaging almost 21,000 employees of the business sector, it's about 81% of the total. Uh, employment is, uh, they're 35% of total employment, 40% of payrolls, and 46% of revenues. And of course, you, you have about 1,000 firms, which are uh, 10,000 or more employees, averaging about 35,000 employees. Now, uh, uh, then if you look at, at a very aggregate level at uh, the sharing of these gains, I already showed you two pictures of this, and we both, we see the changes occur in the late 70s, early 80s and then become greater and greater in terms of income inequality. This is another way of looking at it, which is uh, the percentage change in productivity, labor productivity, and the percentage change in real wages over time. And until the mid to late 1970s, wages tracked productivity, and then you had this divergence, this big gap of productivity uh, uh, far ex exceeding uh, hourly compensation. In fact, hourly compensation remaining quite flat. Um, and so that needs to be explained. And I explain this in terms of uh, basically changing business models. I think it's, it's a big part of the explanation. That back in this old period of what I call retain and reinvest, when pay track productivity, companies retain profits, reinvested in productive capabilities, including the labor force. Uh, and, and part of that investment was that they didn't lay off people. Uh, they kept people employed for a career. Uh, there was a norm in, in the United States, and this is not true outside the United States as well, uh, in large companies in this period, of a career with one company where they're training people who want to retain them. Sometimes that is protected by un union uh, bargaining uh, and seniority, but uh, this also occurs without unions in, in managerial structures. And those people have job security, they get pay raises, they get defined benefit pensions, health coverage. That's how you get a, a strong middle class. It was actually primarily a white male middle class, but that's how you got. And, and, and white males were a larger proportion of the total population uh, back, uh, back then. Uh, but that's how you got this. Then you move to a new economy business model, which was still doing a lot of innovation. A lot of this model came out of Silicon Valley. Uh, where you have a lot of labor mobility, people moving from one job to another. You don't have, at least with startups, you can offer a career with one company. Uh, and you have much more of a global labor force. And companies start doing, once they become successful, uh, once they've actually grown, they don't do this right at the outset because they have to have some money to do this. They start saying, well, let's just... Uh, downsize the labor force. Let's cut wages, let's uh, lay off employees even when we have profits, let's uh, outsource, and let's use that money to prop up our stock prices. Uh, there's lots of reasons why this happened, but this is uh, the way it occurred, and it occurred not only through companies paying out lots of dividends, but also on top of that from the mid-1980s uh, stock uh, repurchases, in which I've done a lot of research and argued that's that change in employment relations is, is a big part of, of, of that gap. It's, it, it's a little more complicated than that. But. Okay, so you go from innovation to financialization, uh, and really to understand this, and understand why financialization has gone, of the corporation has gone so much farther in the United States uh, than elsewhere, it's partly because the United States has had much more innovation through corporations. So there's this big pot of gold there, much bigger, let's say, than in the UK, that you can go and if you can say, lay claim to that, you can say, that's, that's, that's my money. And the way this was done, and this only became an ideology, the merge is really well articulated in the 1980s, coming out of uh, Chicago economics originally, but totally unchallenged by, uh, let's say, the, the East Coast liberals, uh, was an, the notion that companies should be run for their shareholders to maximize shareholder value. And this became a rationale supported by certain institutional changes, including the Security and Exchange Commission becoming a promoter rather than regulator of the stock market that uh, allowed companies to prop up stock prices. Uh, There's a rule called Rule 10b-18, which was adopted under the radar in November 1982, which 
I've written up, we have a paper coming out soon on this called, uh, I call it a license to loop. Basically, this is what's been going on in these companies. And by the way, if anybody's in London, uh, I think Antonio might mention this as well, on, on uh, uh, next week, on the 10th, uh, we're having a conference from a project we have doing comparison with the UK. Okay. Um, now, uh, what's going on in, in, uh, when you have this innovation is what David Teese and others call dynamic capability, something where you're actually improving the productive capabilities uh, of a company in a way that can generate a product that is higher quality uh, and then can get a large market share and drive down through economies of scale unit costs. And that process is uh, uncertain, collective, and cumulative. And out of that notion of the nature of the innovation process in, in the work I've done, constructing what I call a theory of innovative enterprise, come up with three uh, social conditions of innovative enterprise. Strategic control, so you can really think of this as kind of behavioral uh, uh, relations uh, that are within firms or social relations where it matters what the incentives and abilities are of those who actually make the decision to allocate resources in the companies, and that being really a foundation given what households are doing, given what government's doing in investment and productive capabilities. Uh, you need to get some learning out of that, process innovation, product innovation, so there has to be an integration of people, of their skills and effort, into an organizational learning process. And you need financial commitment. And that's because you don't get those products out and uh, all at once. It, it takes time. Uh, and so you have a cumulative process. That's why you need finance to, to, to be committed in the company to uh, allow that to occur. And the foundation, no matter where we look at, at this, when companies can grow and uh, uh, scale, uh, scale up or move from one innovation to another, it's uh, through a corporate, they've had profits and they reinvest a good portion of those profits. They might borrow on top of that, but then they can, they can have some money that can allow them to afford borrowing without uh, threatening bankruptcy. And so what they're doing is they're transforming technologies, accessing markets. Uh, first of all, foremost, they're in, uh, investing in productive, uh, in, 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 in people, in, in the capabilities of people. And unfortunately, we, we don't think often of, uh, or many people don't think of people as actually assets of the company. For one thing, we don't, the company can't own people, so it's on the book as asset. But that's what companies are doing when they're being successful. And uh, capital investment is, anybody can buy, buy machines on the market uh, if you have specific machines that nobody else has because you have the people that can produce them. Okay, now the, the view that then justifies going from retain and reinvest to downsize and tribute uh, is an ideology that I saw you know, a witness coming into business schools uh, uh, and, and then into economics departments in the 1980s and 1990s, the notion you want a company to maximize shareholder value. And uh, underlying it is a notion, not so much of property, but of who bears risk. And the argument is that the only people who bear risk in the economy are shareholders because uh, uh, everybody else gets a guaranteed return. Now that's false, but I'll come back to that. Uh, but out of that notion is, is the notion that uh, you have all this money in companies, it's not explained how you got all those money in companies, and now you have to uh, distribute it to financial markets in order to have it reallocated in the economy. And that's actually the way most economists, no matter where they come from politically, still think. that you, that. you they don't, have, they don't have an understanding of how money gets reinvested in productive capabilities in companies, so they look to the market just to allocate resources. So if they do stock buybacks, uh, there's an argument I've had against the stuff I've written, well, it ends up somewhere in the economy and must be funding, being alter, allocated to alternative uses. And the notion is that the people who bear the risk are the ones who do this allocation. And that was articulated by a guy you everybody I'm sure heard of, Michael Jensen, uh, that what you have to do is discourse of pre cash flow. Now the argument that you're disgorging something is somehow it shouldn't be there. So that if the firm is kind of this big market imperfection, you have all this money, uh, maybe reasons why it's, it's, it's not investing that money very, very well, but the notion is whatever it is, just send it over to the capital, the financial markets and it'll be reallocated. The free cash flow, which is now in almost every financial statement, is a very ideologically wrong <laughs> statement because if you can lay five thousand people off and make who work for the company a long time, you're going to make a lot of cash free, and then you give manager stock based pay in order to incentivize this, and that was basically what was laid out in uh, in the 1980s, um, and that's actually what's precisely what's happened. You've gone from retain and reinvest to downsize and distribute. 
So you've gone to this massive uh, distribution of, uh, of corporate uh, uh, profits and actually often beyond part the, the amount of profits you have even over a decade or two uh, uh, in the form of not only dividends but on top of that stock buybacks. Uh, here we have for the period 2008-2017, the 25 largest repurchase in the United States. We've done, I could spend a few hours just going through various case studies we've done of the damage it does in these companies, but you'll see over on the far right there that uh, many of these companies are set spending over the decade more than 100% of their profits on, on buybacks and dividends, and sometimes on buybacks alone. Um, and then uh, in 2018, you had a massive uh, record amount of buybacks a lot of it being enabled by uh, changes in the tax rules that led to repatriation of profits and uh, tax cuts. Okay. Uh, this is being incentivized by stock-based pay. Uh, in, uh, this is the Piketty and Sage data. It shows up as salaries. You don't actually see it as stock-based pay, but if you look at uh, data from the executive comp database or from proxy statements is where it comes from, you see that for the 500 highest paid executives, let's say in 19, uh, 2017, it's an average of $32 million, and about 80% of that is stock-based. Um, and so that's where, that's where the big bang for the buck comes in. And, and it's increasingly stock awards rather than stock options, but that's, that's where, how, how the incentive are. There's virtually no performance criterion built into this. So the stock price goes up, you, you, you pull in the money, and you have those realized gains. Okay. Um, Compared with uh, some of the hedge fund activists out there, and the ones underlying are the ones who go into companies and rip them apart, people like Tepper, Loeb, Singer, Icon, etc. Uh, they make the, the uh, top 15 corporate executives we take this year for 2016 uh, look like uh, you know, since relative paupers. I mean, they're, they're pulling in lots more money. Okay, now uh, the flawed ideology is that uh, taxpayers and workers take risk every time. When we, we put out money, let's say, for NIH funding for the pharmaceutical industry, we're taking a risk we're going to return, whether we get a return. If the companies don't make money, we don't get a return. And if politically they argue they need lower taxes, then we have that risk also that we're not going to return. If I go work for a company, a company doesn't want me to just work for the pay I get today. They want me to work for the future, and I want to work for the future. Uh, I'm taking a risk that that company won't employ me in the future and I won't get the gain. In fact, that risk has been realized. And as that risk has been realized, uh, it actually undermines the uh, uh, incentive of people to, to actually get the work done and the companies to train those people. The irony of, of shareholder value ideology is the people who take the least risk gain most because shareholders do not invest in companies. They just buy and sell shares. And the liquid stock market means you can get rid of them at any time. Um, just skip over some of this. So it's very two very different views of the world, which come out of what I call innovation theory versus agency theory. Uh, one is uh, rooted in the notion that you invest in productive capabilities. Another one is rooted in what I call the absurd neoclassical argument that the most unproductive firm is the foundation of the most efficient economy. Uh, that's being taught to millions of students every year. It has been since Samuelson came out with his textbook. Uh, and the problem with agency theory is there's no theory of investment in productive capabilities or innovative enterprise. And in fact, shareholder value ideology undermines uh, innovation. Uh, it undermines strategic control. It actually gives executives the wrong incentives in terms of investing in innovation. They make up for themselves while uh, the company can, uh, it, it, it ceases to innovate. It undermines the uh, sharing of the gains, and in, not just in terms of pay, but in terms of job security, employment, uh, 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 more creative employment, etc., with, with your labor force. And it directly undermines financial commitment by taking away the money that could be reinvested in the company. Now, uh, just to end with, uh, as we mentioned in the morning session a couple of times, Milton Friedman's uh, article that appeared in 1970, uh, which people looking back have said this was the uh, call for share maximizing shareholder value, the social responsibility of business to increase its profits. Now, what's important is the context in which this occurred. This is how it actually appeared in the New York Times. That guy there is James Roach. He's the chairman of General Motors. And you can see he's a Friedman doctor, social responsibility to increase its profits. Um, this appeared in September 1970. Now, the uh, small print there, this is the edit editorializing on this. Uh, it says, Taming GM. There was a uh, Nader-inspired, Ralph Nader-inspired movement to put three public interest people on the board of General Motors in order to have uh, more fuel-efficient cars and safer cars. 
Okay, and that was overwhelmingly defeated in May of 1970. That's when that picture of Roach was from that the Admiral shareholders meeting. But then afterwards, because of this movement, they agreed that five uh, directors would be on a public policy committee to consider these issues. And uh, the editor of the New York Times says, the author, Milton Friedman, called such drive for social responsibility in business, pure and unadulterated socialism, Adding business men who talk this way are unwitting puppets of the intellectual forces that have been undermining the base of free society. Okay, now what do you have to think about is not just how absurd that sounds, but in fact, what he was actually saying. He was saying to General Motors, don't produce safer and more fuel efficient cars. That's the future of the automobile industry, if you look forward from 1970. General Motors, we won't go through the whole history, didn't do that the way many other companies did. So they should have put those public interest people on the board. I think they should have put workers on the board as well, but then the UAW would have had to learn how to uh, do things which it doesn't even today know how to do in terms of the company. But basically, that was what, what Friedman was calling pure and adulterated socialism proved to be the future of the automobile industry. And I'll just end with one more example, which we've just written about with a fellow who works with me, Mustafa Erdem Sakinj, on the uh, uh, Boeing crashes. And uh, I won't I'll just have some slides here, but I'll just mention what, what our argument is. is basically um, that uh, actually our preferred, or at least the, the title we suggested for this article was changed by the editors, uh, did uh, Boeing soaring, soaring stock price cause its planes to crash? And uh, we believe that it did, uh, and that the senior executives uh, knew that they were producing, they were selling an unsafe plane, uh, but they didn't want to, uh, you know, killed the golden goose. And the golden goose wasn't just the, the most popular plane in uh, Boeing's history. It was a plane that was allowing them with their soaring prof profits uh, to put about $2 million over the CEO, $2 million in his pocket per month uh, based on, uh, on soaring stock prices and stock-based pay. Okay, I'll end there and uh, turn it over to Antonio. So I, I'll try to, to be quick in the interest of time and the discussion. Um, the way in which I, I try to approach this, this uh, presentation is really drawing on some of the work we've been doing over the last couple of years with uh, research funds from the Gatsby Foundation um, and look at, in specific, at what has been happening in the UK and try to frame that in the context of this conference. So I will start with some reference to uh, how Adam Smith would have probably look at the type of things we are doing and uh, how uh, Adam Smith provides interesting insights. Uh, and I would say not just Adam Smith per se. I mean, the idea that uh, this is not working? Yeah. It's not working. Yeah. Oh, here we are. Uh, the idea that um, um, it's required to look within the pin factory. We, we discussed this morning that actually Adam Smith didn't spend too much time going visiting factories, but the idea that uh, looking within the factory is a way of understanding not simply technical aspects, but actually the broader society, and here the overlap with the other Adam Smith, the Adam Smith of the theory of moral sentiment, I think is, is a theme which was foundational of the classical political economy. Later in the uh, 1830, Babbage started writing about, even before just Babbage was the famous mathematician and, and an economist to a certain extent, an engineer, who in fact visited factories and informed Karl Marx in understanding how division of labor really worked in, during the Second Industrial Revolution, he was starting his work writing up about the institutions that can assure actually the reproduction, the social reproduction of society and later moved to talk about the decline of science in 1830 of the UK and then later on the economics of machinery manufacture. So in other terms, the theme that Adam Smith covered in his sort of uh, uh, analysis on the one side of the theory of moral sentiment and wealth of nation is actually the foundation of that classical political economy uh, uh, perspective that uh, lasted until the marginal, marginalist revolution and more the emergence of neoclassical economics. Now, within that type of framework, there are a couple of insights I would like to stress. The first one is really how Adam Smith understood the idea of productivity, the idea of uh, organization. Uh, and you can find plenty of references in his uh, work where he actually make very clear 
there is, that there is no such a thing as individual productivity, but in fact productivity comes from the way in which uh, people are working together in an organization. And in fact, I would argue that the traditional learning by doing idea is quite problematic, because if you think about a factory and you think someone becoming more productive than others, this can create actually bottlenecks in production if not all the people are organized in a way that allow them to use their talent, if we go back to the team of this morning, uh, or their uh, capabilities in, uh, in production. Another important aspect that I think links the theory of moral sentiments to the uh, wealth of nation is when Adam Smith think about the place in which production happen, happens as a place of uh, a real structure so living together, a sort of to quote the French philosopher Ricoeur, which is basically the idea that the way in which people understand society, understand their role into society, the value that they contribute uh, to the society is actually shaped by the way in which they are involved in the uh, productive organization. And Smith was very concerned in the world of nation about how these things can go pretty wrong. And the last part of this quote is actually mentioning explicitly the fact that a, uh, an exploitative, in this case, form of organizational production where the value creation and the value distribution are completely uh, misaligned, how that actually can lead to the wrong type of sentiments that might actually be uh, a race concerned about the social reproduction and uh, the productivity of this organization. And I think in this context, Smith actually thinks about the impartial spectator. Again, Smith is building on a broader debate, not just the Scottish Enlightenment at the time, the Lombard and Napoleon uh, Enlightenment was actually developing similar type of ideas, which were going back actually to Aristotle and uh, Plato in many respects in terms of the sociability and uh, uh, social contract that society have to uh, uh, develop. And I think in this respect, what uh, the reading of the theory of moral sentiments and wealth of nations suggests is the fact that when this link between the social reproduction within the productive organization and the broader uh, uh, division of labor in society um, is broken, actually there is a, a beginning of decline of, I use here the expression of the industrial ecosystem to, to mean not just what happens within the firm, but what happens within the firm and across firms who are linked uh, in uh, several forms of uh, interdependent uh, productive uh, system. Now, in this context, I think the UK uh, is uh, an in a very good example of a society where uh, the productive system, the decline of the productive system, uh, has been actually going end in end in terms of uh, problems in the, in the society and also uh, we've been talking about inequalities, disparities across regions in the country. And in the UK, probably the way in which this uh, concern has been raised mostly has been around the idea of the so-called productivity puzzle, or the fact that the economy doesn't seem to be able to reproduce the type of productivity levels that was experiencing before the financial crisis. And there have been several studies who have been trying more recently using more data to explain what has been happening. I'll go back to that in, in, a, in one minute. But before I, I go there, I will just want to show you a couple of graphs, one which is telling you how this decline has resulted in uh, a fundamental deindustrialization and uh, lack of competitiveness of the industrial system in the UK. These are data from the OECD, in fact, from the trade value added and combining with the global value added uh, market share. And you can see that across a number of key sectors, including, of course, uh, medium high tech sector, the UK has been losing fundamental shares. And this is not actually going differently in the service industry, which is always considered as a sort of uh, the, the, the saver of the tradable uh, part of the, of the, of the UK uh, economy. So this is just to say that the productivity puzzle has already shown its impact over time in terms of the uh, capacity of this system to generate value and to capture value in the international market. Now, what explanation has been given to this uh, idea of the productivity puzzle? There have been several explanations uh, which probably start pointing out in the right, right direction talking about you know, what has been happening in terms of, if you want, the in, uh, lack of industrial restructuring in the UK economy, and so a more structural explanation of the sectoral composition of the economy. Nick Kraft has wrote about it. Um, problems around uh, the, the way in which there is limited productivity enhancing reallocation of inputs following the financial crisis. So in other terms, again, the idea that 
Uh, there has been a problem in terms of reallocating the value that the system is able to generate. And of course, closer to the new technologies, intangibles, and so on. What was striking to us was that many of these ideas were actually not responding to the uh, Smithian <laughs> type of initial intuition that we, look, we need to look within productive organization if we want to understand why this productivity puzzle is in place. Uh, closest that I could see people have been gone uh, is actually trying to at least capture some of the heterogeneity in the problem. So trying to capture how this productivity puzzle in fact affect all sorts of sectors, in fact in some cases even the uh, medium high tech manufacturing industries and how across industries and across workers within this industry and firms there is huge divergence in terms of their capacity to generate uh, value in being productive. Now, if we want to understand though the, uh, the reason, the drivers of these uh, type of heterogeneity and this type of uh, uh, productivity puzzle, uh, we would argue that it's required to actually uh, unpack this nexus between productivity and financialization. And here I'm building on some of the issues that have been raised already, which is actually the idea that in order to develop and, and deploy effectively productive capabilities, there are certain type of corporate governance conditions that have to be met, both within firms at the level of what is happening within uh, the, the public companies and before was the private companies was also brought into the discussion, but I would say it's the industrial ecosystem at large. And let me give you just a, a hint of what I mean with that. I work a lot in the famous so-called third Italy Emilia Romagna model. And one of the things that struck me working with firms there was that during the financial crisis, uh, the biggest private companies, the majority are private, many of them state-owned companies, actually took the responsibility of uh, reducing risk at the level of the supply chain in various forms, in terms of uh, participating in some of the shares, in terms of getting long-term contracts. So in other terms, they try to preserve the capacity, the industrial commons, if you want uh, to, to use Pisano's expression, of that ecosystem of firms. So the problem is not just within the firms, but how the firms, especially the system integrators one, operate in this, in this area. And this type of discussions have raised some, some uh, uh, concern about what do we know about what is happening in the major uh, companies in the UK, in particular in the air value manufacturing industries here. Um, and we basically spent with Marie and uh, Bill and other colleagues uh, a number of, a couple of years in looking at uh, the history of these companies since the uh, mid-90s, early 2000s, and looking at what has been their performances in terms of these financialization on the one end and uh, investment uh, uh, on the other side, Nexus. And when we look at the companies like BAE, or Royce, and GKN, we are not looking just at a few companies, we are looking actually at the industry as a large. Because if the three companies, for example, just to give you a an indicator, they account for almost 90%, 87% of all the R&D of, of, of that sector. So we are talking about companies who are really determining the extent to which uh, you have productive investment, long-term productive investment, or in fact you have a financialized, financialized system. And similarly, you uh, can say something very similar around the role that GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca have in the broader uh, uh, farm and biopharma uh, industry. Now, I'll give you some, some idea of what we found. Uh, we don't have time uh, to go through some of these cases. Marie will mention a few other things that are uh, probably give you a flavor of that. And I, uh, I will end up giving you some reference to the conference next week we are having in London to, uh, for those of you interested in getting more material, and will be published the result of, of the research. So the first type of um, data that I would like to show is related really to the different degree of financialization that we, we observe looking at the top 500 uh, companies in the US and top uh, 250 Europe, extracting the companies, the 72 from uh, the UK, and analyzing basically a main indicator of financialization, which is really the total payout uh, per company, so both stock uh, uh, buybacks and, and dividends. And what you observe is, of course, that the US is in a much higher trend towards, uh, in terms of financialization, uh, while the UK has been uh, outperforming, if we can use the expression, uh, European uh, companies in a, in a, uh, for a long period of time, although more recently there has been a sort of uh, convergence in terms of their, of their trend. What is interesting is also to look at the composition of this indicator, which is the extent to which you observe 
financialization in terms of dividends distribution or actually stock buybacks. And here the very simple story without going into the details is actually that we observe across all sectors a fundamental uh, dominance of dividends distribution as the main form of extracting uh, resources out of the, of the company. Um, and that is particularly so in the context of the biopharma industry until uh, the uh, early 2010-12 when actually the dividend policy became actually the, the, main, the main instrument for uh, uh, or driver of financialization in this respect. If we go down gradually towards the sectoral level again you can see that the manufacturing average is the red one. There is a slow trend towards uh, increasing the degree of uh, payout uh, uh, by sector but there is also lots of heterogeneity around what is happening on top of the of that you will see in one slide that actually few companies are driving the financialization within that sector and you can also see here that the service industry is equally uh, pushing as an average uh, the uh, financialization towards uh, some level of increase of course in a quite uh, significant significant scale in billions uh, of pounds. Now if we look at the company level so we start getting closer to uh, the uh, companies we've been studying actually you realize that, uh, again, there is significant heterogeneity, uh, but the biopharma industry, uh, so GlaxoSmithKline is the, uh, how to call it, is the yellow, the dark yellow on top, um, and uh, the, um, uh, some of the AstraZeneca is actually the, this yellow, the bold one there. Um, so these are the two uh, companies which have shown the highest level of uh, payout uh, over a significant period of time and what is interesting is that this is continuing even after the, uh, the patent cliff and significant decline in, in sales. Um, another parameter that we looked at is really trying to identify how the CO payment has been changing. Bill already mentioned issues around how this can distort a number of incentives within uh, the boards and within the decisions that firms make. Um, here you have the average employee pay ratio which reached uh, 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 critical points. These are five uh, observation points from 2000, sorry this should have been 2000, 2007, 15, 16, 16 and 17. Although there is a, a decline trend we are still at extremely high uh, ratios and also we'll be looking at the composition and how the composition of CO payments has been uh, dramatically shifting from cash-based towards more share-based uh, 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 remuneration and how the share-based remuneration in combination with uh, stock buybacks operation can actually give uh, a significant hedge in terms of uh, realized gains which is actually the uh, uh, bar, the yellow, dark and um, uh, light uh, 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 yellow in the, in, the other, in the other chart. Now to conclude, a number of factors that seems to emerge it's really, as already mentioned, uh, dividends is the main form of value extraction in the context of the UK uh, when we look at financialization. Uh, we've been at, in the previous session, there has been quite a lot of discussion around the evolution of the way in which different type of uh, ownership structures in the UK have been uh, uh, evolving in, the, in these industries. Um, and uh, also the pattern in terms of reduction in uh, investment vis-a-vis -vis, uh, strategies in acquisition of companies, so trying to leverage or uh, uh, capture capabilities developed outside. Um, a certain degree of, of uh, financialization and heterogeneity of financialization within certain sectors and cases in which actually, for example, BAE, uh, when BAE exit the uh, Airbus, going back to the first presentation consortium, the cash that was made out of that being actually used in the uh, couple of years after for a stock buyback operation of a uh, significant uh, amount, which means uh, dynamics of uh, divergence between some of these firms, for example, Rolls Royce on the contrary seems to maintain much more strategic control of their internal resources over time. And I would say all this, and I'll conclude with that, all this type of analysis is in the context of understanding the extent to which the broader institutions that and regulations that have been evolving in the context of the UK have allowed and made legal to make certain type of operation and the extent to which this has uh, gone end in end with uh, government uh, at least uh, 
declared the intention of supporting the development of this industry with industrial strategies. I was in Cambridge when the uh, government was still uh, uh, starting, especially Vince Cable was a big uh, promoter of uh, the new industrial strategy, and now we have a new version of a new industrial strategy, and all that type of analysis was really trying to look at how this type of sector and businesses, in particular aerospace, which was largely supported, are uh, in need of financial support to boost their investment. Now, that analysis of what the government is doing to support an industry which actually has significant cash that could use for this investment seems to be something that has to be joined up in order to make uh, any form of industrial strategy intervention actually effective. I'll stop there. Thanks. I work in a business school as part of a group of French engineering schools, Institut Mintelecom. Uh, the research that I'm going to present to you today has been funded by the Institute of New Economic Thinking. <coughs> um, I want to use my presentation to give you a concrete example of a major corporation which we believe presents the characteristics that some of the speakers have mentioned both this morning and on today's panel, which we call financialization. This is characterized by value extraction, which is increasingly through share buybacks, as well as, as exorbitant stock-based compensation of top management. We believe that financialization undermines a firm's ability to invest in innovative capabilities, and this is what is necessary to guarantee its future prosperity. So at first glance, Cisco Systems, the company I want to talk about, may appear to be an exemplary Silicon Valley firm. It has grown steadily over the, 30, the past 35 years. It continues to maintain market share of over 50% in its two key markets of routers and switches, which are basically the plumbing of the internet. These two segments are no longer growing rapidly, but together they do represent uh, um, revenues of $45 billion in 2018. So these two sectors have represented significant cash cows for the company over the past 20 years. Since 2002, however, Cisco has chosen to distribute a significant proportion of this cash to its shareholders. In total, over 16 years, the company has spent $144 billion buying back its own shares, which corresponds to an average of $8 billion annually in share buybacks. The last two years have been particularly striking, as Cisco Systems announced that it would use the windfall gains of US tax reform to reward shareholders. For this reason, on average, over the past two years, the company has repurchased an extraordinary $20 billion of its own shares. Uh, its share price understandably jumped 6% on the day that this was announced in February 2018. So CEO, uh, the CEO Cisco would argues that the company has kept plenty of dry powder uh, for other activities. And many argue in favor of buybacks for companies such as Cisco who continue to invest significantly nonetheless in R&D. So for Cisco, if we compare investment in R&D and CapEx, which is in blue, with the level of what we call value extraction in red, which represents buybacks and dividends, we can see that the company has significantly changed, changed how it used its earnings over the past two decades. In the 90s, it's true there was a small amount of share buybacks, but this was primarily to compensate for dilution from employees uh, um, cashing in their stock options. In the 21st century, however, buybacks have become a key form of value extraction for shareholders of Cisco stock. To understand how dramatic this change is, it's important to go back to the foundations of Cisco Systems in Silicon Valley on the Stanford campus in the 1980s. The company's growth accelerated with the rollout of the internet throughout the 1990s, and it was even briefly the world's most valuable company uh, in March 2000. In addition to the scale of its growth, the company was also remarkable for developing the idea that acquisitions can form the basis for a sustainable innovation strategy. And this was how it planned to move into the more technologically challenging sector of optical networking at the turn of the century. Cisco was the epitome of the new economy business model in an era of open systems architecture. At this point, we believed that Cisco had accumulated the necessary capabilities to position itself at the heart of major technological change over the coming decades. And in this respect, it was poised to be the IBM of the 21st century. 
In fact, when the internet and telecom bubbles burst in 2000 and 2001, Cisco's growth was not significantly impacted. Its strategy, however, appears to have been, and it has become one of value extraction through buybacks initially, and from 2011 um, with dividends. Between 2002 and 2017, there have only been four years when buybacks and dividends did not surpass income. I left out the last two years because they were just so crazy, so they, they put everything out of scale. Um, and even with 2015, it was 99%. So what we can really say is over this 16-year period, there were 13 years where um, Cisco shareholders have extracted more value from the company than the company generated in terms of profitability. So clearly, top management at the top of the company is encouraged to support the company's share price through stock-based compensation schemes. Between 1995 and 2015, CEO John Chambers received compensation of 686 million, the equivalent of 34 million per year. The take-home compensation that we've calculated for his successor, Chuck Robbins, has already increased from 16 million in 2015 to 21 million in 2018, and a bit like we've uh, just seen in the UK, between 60 and 75% of his compensation is stock-based. The strategic implication of Cisco management's choice of value extraction rather than investment has been most clear to us in the optical networking sector. In the late 90s and again in the noughties, the company announced its intention to become number one <coughs> or number two in this segment. However, it in encountered some problems with customer relationship management, but also its refusal, point blank refusal to engage in manufacturing has limited its ability to develop the systems integration capabilities that are necessary to succeed in this segment. We can also see here on the blue line from the drop off in patent applications that Cisco did not maintain a steady level investment in this segment. Since 2012 with the red line, uh, it has acquired uh, core optics and it is again targeting this segment, but it is far from the leader as it intended to be, as this position is occupied by Huawei, the Chinese new entrant. As you can see, Huawei has been investing steadily in optical technologies for the past two decades. Cisco has exhibited similar strategic hesitation and reluctance to commit long-term in a number of areas. It has been unsuccessful in penetrating consumer markets and has also withdrawn from less profitable business markets such as video services for service providers. In 2011, when Cisco announced layoffs of 4,000 employees, it was in order to make savings of one billion. And this was the same amount that the company spent in a single quarter buying back its own stock. In the trade-off between innovation and financialization, or what we call between value creation and value extraction, we argue that Cisco has moved to the value extraction side of the trade-off and is consequently therefore no longer positioned to, be, to dominate technological developments as IBM did in the past century. We believe that Cisco was a truly innovative company at the start of its corporate history and that engaged in the learning processes necessary to develop cutting edge technological solutions for its customers. To do so, it reinvested its earnings and offered cumulative and collective careers to its employees and to those that it acquired. Ironically, perhaps its dominance of the traditional segments of routers and switches may have contributed to its reluctance to engage in the long-term learning process in other segments where it was in head-to-head -head competition with competitors who were willing to develop manufacturing and customer level skills and were uh, willing also to move upstream into critical component development. So as growth in its two main markets, routers and switches, has slowed, Cisco now finds itself obliged to continue to distribute to shareholders as it also desperately seeks growth markets where in segments where it is not going to be the dominant player and where it is not willing to commit to the same level of investment in developing capabilities as the other competitors. We therefore believe that the pivotal role played by IBM in the IT sector in the 20th century will not be played by Cisco in the future, but by a company that is more committed to investment to build capabilities. Uh, although today it is far from certain how the geopolitical situation will evolve in relation to Huawei, the Chinese company has undoubtedly grown to dominate the sector in the past two decades in a quite spectacular fashion. So finally, while Cisco was initially an exemplary company in terms of new forms of innovation and rapid growth, 20 years of buybacks have eroded its ability to invest in the organizational integration of personnel into cumulative and collective learning processes. 
During this time, and in numerous segments, Huawei has succeeded where Cisco has failed. For US companies such as Cisco, financialization has now been in place for almost two decades, and its consequences are becoming clearer. For European firms, the dangers of adopting such practices needs to be recognized. For markets such as Cisco, where competition is now clearly global, the relative lack of financialization of Asian firms is potentially a source of long-term competitive advantage. Thank you. My name is uh, Steve Benning. I, um, a few words about myself. I was born in Sydney, Australia. I went to high school called Scots College and wandered around in a kilt uh, for some time. And so it's somewhat nostalgic to be here in Edinburgh. Uh, I then worked as a lawyer. I studied law in Australia. I went to Oxford University. I studied some more law. And then I went to Washington, D.C. and joined the World Bank where I worked uh, for many years as a manager in all sorts of different roles. I met Robert McNamara and uh, all sorts of interesting things. I led a big strategic change. I left in 2000 and then started meeting with organizations and figuring out how could we run organizations better than what I'd seen in the World Bank, and, uh, which was a fairly low bar. Uh, but uh, it was uh, very interesting. And um, in due course, I wrote uh, eight books, and this uh, Age of Agile is my latest book, which details a rather simplified uh, picture that I'm about to convey to you. Because I'd like to talk a little bit about what is the kind of issue that we're talking about when we're talking about reshaping capitalism. What, what sort of an issue is that? Is that an issue of examining balance sheets of firms, or is it a, a different kind of issue? And I'm going to be suggesting that it's a different kind of issue. In 1533, an amateur Polish astrologer had a meeting with the Pope, Pope Clement VII, and he had an unusual idea. At the time, people knew that the Earth revolved around the Sun. They could see it from the evidence of their senses, and everyone knew that. This astrologer called uh, Copernicus told the Pope that's not so. The evidence of the senses is wrong, people are wrong. In fact, the earth revolves around the sun. We have to understand the world differently. And in fact, the, the Pope was thrilled with this because it was a better way to calculate the path of the stars. Uh, but in due course, it became apparent that this new idea uh, put in question not just the way the universe was structured in terms of stars, but it started to put in question the whole structure of human society. Because if the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, was it really plausible uh, that we have the divine right of kings and that the Roman Catholic Church is the center of the universe? People started to raise those kinds of questions. You got the clicker. And uh, I have the clicker. <laughs> he said this is a different picture. It, instead of the uh, Earth being the center of the universe, in fact, the sun is the center of our galaxy, and this we have to reorient our thinking to this. And so this led to a whole set of changes, and it was resisted ferociously uh, for over a hundred years. Galileo was put in prison for the rest of his life, and, and the church fought it for a couple of hundred years. So big transformational changes like this, which transform everything that we see about the world, have normally faced huge resistance. Fast forward to um, uh, our friend Adam uh, back in 1776. Uh, we heard this morning that um, a, a businessmen, uh, everyone, everyone has, according to Adam Smith, Adam Smith believed that everyone uh, has a moral compass. Everyone has moral values, and that is the, the nature of the human being. Uh, when I read... Um, Wealth of Nation recently, I couldn't find any evidence of that in terms of businessmen. Businessmen were talked about in a very, very different way in Wealth of Nations. Businessmen were referred to as people who are only concerned with their own self-interest. He, he said that 36 times on my count in uh, Wealth of Nations, so it wasn't just 
the off, uh, off reference, this was something that he mentioned. And he seemed to think that businessmen were rather bad people. Uh, you shouldn't ever let them get together because if they got together, they would start to have conspiracies and start to do things contrary to the public interest. The only thing that kept them in bay was not regulation or not any moral interest, but the power of the customer, the discipline of the customer to keep uh, those uh, very bad businessmen in check. Fast forward to uh, 1954. Um, by this time, the idea that business uh, looks after its own interests, business is in business to make money for itself, uh, was, was widespread. And in fact, uh, big corporations um, were dominating the marketplace. And Peter Drucker said, maybe there's a better idea. Maybe there's a better way to run the world. What if, what if corporations focus not on fighting customers and trying to uh, bilk uh, customers? What if they focused on delivering value to customers? What if they focused on creating customers? Wouldn't that be a better world? And he declared, this is the only valid purpose of a corporation to create customers, not to maximize value, to create customers. So we said this in 1954, and again in 73, and again in 85. So it was something that he rather uh, adhered to. But um, no one really took him seriously, as with Copernicus. Um, his um, ideas were basically rejected, in fact, uh, as we just heard, business went in totally the opposite direction and focused on maximizing shareholder value, not customer value, shareholder value. <coughs> and uh, so the, uh, this was not exactly a triumph. Um, and, and this went on for another 50 years or so until we got the uh, early part of the um, uh, 20th century when we started to see some firms were actually starting to implement this. Some firms were actually devoting themselves to creating value for customers and seeing that making money was the result of creating value for customers. And when I came across this um, uh, practice in 2008, I was writing a book on high performance teams and looking for teams that were highly energized and I found large numbers of teams in software development that were actually practicing this. They were totally focused on giving value for customers and that created very meaningful workplaces. And the firms were actually doing brilliantly at the same time. So I thought, this is an amazing idea. This is, these people have figured out a solution to a problem that has stumped management for a century. How do you get disciplined execution with continuous innovation? Big organization could do one or the other, they couldn't do both. These people had figured out how to do both. And I said, well, this, this is a huge idea. <laughs> the world doesn't know about this idea. We have to actually get this idea out there. And so I wrote a book about it. And in software development, it was well received. But in general management, I was told this is ridiculous. You're talking about little firms. You're talking about software. We're never going to learn anything from software people. Those are the worst kind of people living in the basement. And <laughs> these are not really serious. It's not going to last. It's never going to be big. The big serious organizations are going to be IBM and GM and GE, these are, will always be the big organizations in the world. And these little, piddling little software firms, they are never going to be serious competitors. Even the, the CEO of IBM said, made fun of uh, firms that have names like a piece of fruit, uh, that they would never be serious uh, organizations. But uh, in fact, uh, what uh, Peter Drucker had been suggesting was a Copernican revolution in management, that we need to see the world in a different way, that instead of firms being the center of the commercial universe, in fact, customers were the center of the commercial universe. And if you ran organizations on that basis, you would not only have happy customers, you would make a ton of money. And when he wrote that back in 1954, there was very little evidence, but by 2019, <laughs> the evidence was in. In fact, firms being run on this basis were making huge amounts of money. They were, in fact, the largest and fastest growing firms on the planet. And for now, Apple was now seven times larger than IBM, and GE is being sold off, off as scrap. Uh, so this, this set of ideas about how to run 
organizations, which comes under various names, but it is a kind of different way of understanding how to run organization, how to get things done in the world, fundamentally different way of looking at the world. And what it creates is this, it creates instant, intimate, frictionless, incremental value at scale. What I'm talking about is when you have your iPhone and you do something, it happens instantly and it's there just for you. And it's frictionless, it's fun. And once you've had that experience, you want it again. So this way of delivering value, which initially is an option, once people have had it, they want it everywhere. They want it whenever they're dealing with the world, they want this kind of experience. So this starts to become the norm of corporate performance. The problem, of course, is that this is a deep change for organizations, and most organizations have had trouble coming to terms with what it's like. And one of the reasons is that um, uh, in the 20th century firm said, well, this uh, customer thing, we're, of course we're for the customer, the customer is number one, but in the background, there is an unstated proviso. We have the customer is number one, but only insofar as that's compatible with the way we run our organization. And if the way we run our organization is, doesn't fit that, I'm sorry. So, for instance, uh, Microsoft 10 years ago had a process for doing its work where it would design design it for one year and <laughs> construct it for two years and then deliver it. Uh, and when it was in the construction phase, it couldn't take any new suggestions. So if you made a suggestion to Microsoft, even one they agreed with, even one that was brilliant, uh, it would be three to five years before that idea would ever see the light of day. So they were unable, in a sense, to, be, to respond to this much faster moving uh, marketplace. So this is a, a deep change. It means willing, being willing to sacrifice anything in the organization in order to deliver value for customers. And this actually sheds some light on the tension between the theory of moral, moral sentiments and the wealth of nations, in that wealth of nations, basically business uh, act out of self-interest, uh, moral sentiments, human beings feel sympathy for others. But Peter Drucker was saying, was, that's both true, because if, if in fact organizations have sympathy for others, have empathy for their clients, understand their, their clients' needs, and see exactly what will thrill them and please them and delight them and deliver products and services, do that, then they are dealing with both wings of this argument. They are, on the one hand, creating a ton of money because clients love it, and they are also exercising this sentiment of understanding other human beings. And so I believe this is one of the ways in which to reconcile uh, these two very, very different books. Uh, this is not a panacea. Uh, some of these companies are doing bad things, and those things should be fixed. There are monopolies which are always bad, there are invasions of privacy, always bad. But that shouldn't <coughs> hide the fact that the underlying way in which they're being run is very different and very profitable and potentially hugely important for the rest of business. So my message uh, is rather simple to bureaucracies, the GEs and the GMs and the IBMs of the world, change or die. Unless you uh, come to terms with this, uh, you don't have a bright future. But for those firms that do come to terms with this, the future is very bright because we know now how to create organizations that are both good for the fund, good for the, the customer, good for the people doing the work, and good for society. Thank you. on this panel and uh, trying to figure out whether we are at a tipping point in terms of the dominance of the shareholder value model and uh, whether we will soon maybe have a cooperation corp revolution, I hope. <laughs> but as was said before, uh, it is facing a huge resistance. So I will say a few words just to recap what has been already said in terms of how much the shareholder supremacy model is questionable and is being questioned de facto. 
I will say a few words to be intellectually honest with you about the role of the OECD, because I'm representing the OECD here, even though I speak in on my own name. And, uh, and then I will discuss a bit the pressure points, what, what, uh, where the pressure is coming from these days in terms of changing the model. And I will try to, to conclude with really asking you a question, I think asking you to help us to make change happen. So first, um, we, we have heard a lot this morning and also some, some hard decision that the shareholder supremacy model that, that goes with financialization, etc., is very much questioned and, 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 and questionable. Um, first, theoretically, uh, it has been mentioned by Professor Lazanik, you know, the, the shareholders are not the owners of the companies, uh, they are not so much at risk, etc., etc. But all these theoretical arguments are not new. They could have been done and they have been done like 20 years ago at the beginning of this. Uh, supremacy of the shareholder model, so apparently they have not been strong enough to, to question it. Um, this, we have heard a lot also this morning and this afternoon what have been the consequences of this model in terms of inequality, rising inequalities, in terms of precarious uh, working conditions, in terms of uh, lagging, uh, sagging productivity, this productivity puzzle that you were mentioning, in terms of environmental degradation, etc. And also in terms of now the political situation in which we are, which is quite dangerous. And that is linked to this, all these deleterious consequences of this model, I think. Um, I think you said, Antonio, it's the wrong type of sentiments that now we are seeing in our political uh, life. And of course, I won't mention the ex uh, what I would call like the extreme manifestation of the shareholder dominance model with the, the share buybacks and the value destruction in fact, that goes with it. Um, there are a lot of also discussion that we had this morning about the short term short termism of this model, um, and I was a little bit skeptical about your answer, Madam, but. <laughs> like uh, somehow proposing a little bit more of the same recipe to fix the short-termism, having a little bit more of the traditional corporate governance uh, uh, instruments like aligning incentive, more engagement uh, uh, with investors, etc. I'm not sure if we fix the problem, but that's a comment. <laughs> and uh, then also we could discuss a lot the link with the big uh, financial crisis. So all, to say, all that to say that I think the shareholder model law is, uh, is really I mean, questionable and is very much questioned. And to be honest, I'm working for the OECD. The OECD has played a role in this legitimation of this model of the, the dominance of shareholder, uh, and also in globalizing this model a lot. We were not alone, but I think we were an important player in this. Um, and we are still like instrumental in maintaining this model alive, I would say. Uh, together with our colleagues from the EU. So, uh, there, there are, my question really is uh, why it's so difficult to change this model, and that's what I'm personally trying to do within the OECD, but it's not an easy proposition. In spite of the fact that we have a lot of pressure points, if you look at uh, what are the current influence and what is, where is the current debate on this model, uh, you have a lot of uh, questions from the customers. The customers are demanding more and more that the companies behave responsibly, behave with a long-term perspective, you know, strategically, etc. Um, and maybe based on the, this issue of moral sentiment, I don't know how to explain that. Uh, you might ask why, what's new, because why now and not before? I think what's new is that with the digital economy, they have more trends, the customers, they can organize themselves much better. And it was also discussed this morning, the wisdom of the code. I mean, there is more trends to, to this pressure from customers. And also with the climate change discussion, environmental discussion, I think that there is a new uh, uh, sense of urgency from the customers on what the companies are doing. Then if you look at the employees, you have a lot of big businesses that begin to feel the pressure from the young, the people they want to employ, especially the young generations, these famous millennials, that somehow don't want anymore to work in these big corporations, big bureaucracies, 
Uh, you might also question that saying, okay, they will become old, they will have mortgages, they will have kids, so they might become more cynical getting older. Uh, but I think that this new generation with the climate, climate again and the environmental urgency might behave differently than uh, we have done. And then the, big, the, big, the third element that I think it's a big one is this new digital economy. It has been discussed a lot this morning and again this afternoon, like the, the, the old uh, big corporations of the 20th century that are at risk to die and are always being kind of disappearing in front of the new generation generation of digital companies. Uh, so all this questioning about uh, what makes the enterprise, that's this collective innovation, etc. Uh, I think this is also something that could that could trigger a fundamental change and a questioning of this shareholder predominance model. And the, the fourth pressure that I think is very important it's coming from the investors, but of course it's quite, uh, there are a lot of different views within the investors population. You have uh, the passive ones, the active ones, the big ones, the small ones, etc. And you could, and some are very vocal and people don't believe them. Larry Fink says that he wants to invest for the long term, etc. But some say he's purely cynical. Um, and I think what is crucial in this discussion is that the whole thing about their own conflict of interest and whether the fiduciary duty should be interpreted one way or the other. Because it has been an argument uh, very often used to say uh, they have to represent their fiduciary and so they have to invest to maximize share shareholder value in the short term, etc. But this might not be true. So I think there is a big... Uh, uh, Something that is changing these days, how you define the fiduciary duty of investors, and that could really be the tipping point in this sense, in this debate. And last but not least, I was very interested by what you mentioned about the, the, the Chinese or the Huawei uh, of this world. I think, yes, we have a new competition from companies that might have a different model that allow long-term vision and long-term investment much more than what we have in the Western world is this uh, shareholder dominance model. So we have a lot of pressures this day, but why it's not changing? If you look at the numbers that you showed us, it's not yet changing in spite of all these pressures. So my question, and it's a question to you, it's a question that I'm asking myself every day, how to make change happen more quickly? Uh, before we have a huge problem, it was mentioned also this morning that uh, I mean, we have a lot of uh, resentment from the right, from the left, and uh, we might have really political problem very soon, if not already. So how to make this happen, this cooperation change happen more quickly? Uh, from my perspective, working at the OECD, I see it's very difficult in our usual business as usual type of discussion to make things happen. The only way I think we could change the discussion is to have a much more inclusive one, including the trade unions more in our discussion, including the business more in our discussion, including the civil society, and including business and all these people from emerging economies more. So to open our bubble a little bit of uh, because at the OECD it's a bubble of uh, representative of administrations, policy makers or regulators, <coughs> and, and make, make sure that all these pressures are felt in the discussion from the customers, from the employees, from the business itself, and from emerging economies. Thank you. And please help me to answer this question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, now uh, we do have time for uh, discussion. And so we'll just open up for questions or comments, please. Um, I have a mic back here. Um, I know it's a small room, but if we uh, use the mic, we can pick it up better on the camera. Um, everyone can hear. Um, so I, can, or I, can start. I have a comment.
many, many, many years ago, I used to be a serious athlete, and everybody was telling us, you got to eat carbs. It's just about carbs. You eat carbs always. And 20 years later, now it's, you don't eat any carbs. Carbs are bad. You eat protein and um, other things. Um, I'm a scientist. I'm not a don't have a business background, but I did go to business training in the early 2000s. This is not working. It is. It is. It is. It is. It is. it helping like that? It's yeah. recording. Okay. It's just recording. All right. Um, and so I'm very um, happy and relieved by what I heard today, uh, but I'm also a little bit upset and disappointed because when I went through business school training, and I can say that probably 90% of us in the class uh, were listening to those ideas about, it's all about shareholding va shareholder value and it's only about that. We all had a very um, innate negative reaction to it. It was almost, uh, it didn't make sense. It didn't feel right. And I remember going through these conversations with the teachers who were teaching us good business practices and they had an argument for every argument we would make, they had a ton of argument. And at the end of the day, they convinced us, the practitioners, the people who are now running businesses, that this was the right thing to do. So the question is, how do we make sure we get it right next time and we don't teach those, um, let's call them semi-falsehoods, and send people out in the world with those ideas? Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, we can take some more questions. So we, we, okay, well, let's take a few more questions. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Jigley from London Business School. Um, uh, a couple of things. First, I think it's my own quick reaction. They're not falsehoods. They may be right for their time, and they may outlive their purpose. So I don't think that in social uh, science there's something that is true or not true. It works in a particular historical context or not, and you can certainly push it to the extreme. But going back to the broader theme, I think that the question to Bill as well as everyone else, um, I've been wondering whether, first of all, uh, we should not be a little bit more careful in terms of what we wish for. So Bill, to be entirely honest, I don't want Apple not to buy back its shares, and I am seriously concerned about the acquisition with which Google is expanding. Why? Because if you think about it in terms of its own dominance, then I might say, yes, there may be opportunities missed. And I believe that the Cisco story is one of the illustrators of that, how it missed some opportunity. The problem that we have now in spades is that you do have some organizations that are gobbling up anything that could potentially dislodge them. So we may want to be slightly more careful about simply saying that the problem society has is that strong firms don't use their money to become stronger. Uh, there may need to be a point where you're like, yes, we have been sitting over a pot of gold and we are returning that. So I think that there is an empirical question on whether you have reached a place where there isn't a reasonable use of the money or not. I don't think it's an article of faith and I'm a little concerned with anything that has categorical views in terms of this is always bad. Maybe, may not be, the data that we're starting to look at I think are great. And related to that, um, that may, which I think comes out from the story of Huawei, it may have to do with an empirical question on what is the extent to which we think that it is important for incumbents to continue innovating. Because one of the things that we have seen in Western economies is that there is a shift of innovation with a much greater willingness of new firms to have a remarkable amount of losses uh, and to be funded to continue accumulating losses uh, and we are seeing a shift in terms of what is the locus of innovation. And the final thing, which is something which I haven't quite found in this work, perhaps I've read it a little too cursorily, is that there is a big distinction between capex and innovation. There are businesses like telcos that have big capex, 13, 14%, saying, oh my God, you don't put the money for capex is one thing. They, in telcos, not only don't innovate, they should not be allowed to innovate because they've been dreadful when they've tried innovation. They should be even to other people who can do it better. So we should not conflate the amount of money that is being put with the innovation intensive effort that we want to get. And I'm a little con concerned that through 
completing this in one metric, we're not oversimplifying that and creating a bigger problem than the one we started potentially resolving. Thank you. Um, first of all, to reflect the first two uh, questioners, I should say that as a, uh, a business school uh, alumnus and an LBS alumnus at that, um, I'm sure we're always only taught the things that are relevant at the time and they always change. That's the whole point of dynamic capability. So I'm, I'm not worried. As the dean of the business school who owns this building, though, um, I want to just say that um, uh, it, for me, and I, I've been renovating this building and, uh, for the last three years, um, it's still very special every time I come in here. And as we sit in this room today, uh, this is the very room in which Adam Smith entertained his friends every Sunday for lunch and talked about the things that were important in the world. And I came specifically to this session, um, mainly because of dying to hear Bill in the flesh, um, having read him for so many years, but also because I knew that this is exactly the kind of topic that Adam Smith would have loved to have heard debate here. And his uh, central point, of course, was that rather like the Johnson & Johnson credo that we were discussing this morning, uh, was that there are multiple stakeholders uh, in the prosperity of a firm. And, uh, and the share buyback, of course, as we know, uh, and has been ably shown, only benefit a very small proportion of stakeholders. And so how do you divide something that, that benefits all stakeholders is the kind of thing you wanted to learn at business school. Um, and I would just suggest one thing, which is that uh, I think the reason why, and by the way, I also sit as a Public company director of public companies on either side of the Atlantic. And I'll tell you, from when you sit at the top of a public company and all you hear from shareholders is, why are you not doing a buyback? I mean, literally, I would probably hear that from a shareholder every other week. Um, and especially at times when the stock price is depressed. The, but the, the thing is, you can, if you only measure return on capital employed, and that is all that they can measure, then if you don't measure the things that you value, you will only end up valuing things that you can measure. And so because people can measure the return they are getting from what you term financialization, and they can't easily measure, or there is no common recognized measure of employee well-being, uh, of community well-being, of customer value added, because they could measure those things so easily, or there is no common measure, they don't value them. So I call for us to think about, okay, if you want something different, you're going to have to work out how you measure it. Yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, this one. May, may I add one more question to the, uh, to the list of questions, which is we, the, the issue about talent, maybe teaching this a little bit, talent more broadly has come up a lot in, in your conversations this morning as well. Um, and, and one of the, and, and I think that there's quite good evidence that talent is being underinvested in by the um, traditional sources of investment in talent, partly because, as you pointed out, you don't own the employees, right? You can train employees and then take them, leave them, go somewhere else. Um, so in the situation, which of course is, is I can't imagine changing, where labor is mobile, um, how do we how do we encourage investment in something that can walk out the door and have that long-term um, J-curve? Okay. Uh, let me just, uh, uh, if I guess I was responding to thoughts specifically, so I think the Apple example is a good one, and I have written on this. Um, so first of all, uh, if you, from a company point of view, you accumulate all this, this money and you say, where did it come from? Okay, uh, it didn't just come from Apple. Apple built on a whole ecosystem, and including my taxpayer money, and uh, uh, the, you know, so that's, that's the first thing to know. Second thing is that Apple calls this program uh, that has distributed uh, $270 billion in buybacks, another $80 billion in dividends uh, since basically 2013, their capital return program. Both those words are false. It's not a return program. The only time Apple ever got money from public shareholders was in 1980 in its IPO for $97 million. And once it was public, anybody could cash in at any time they wanted. And anybody who's held the shares since then, I don't know if there is anybody, they probably wouldn't want them to do buybacks because they've been holding on to those shares and looking for reinvestment. Secondly, 
uh, the, uh, the, that money does not just need to go to, for Apple to grow bigger. Uh, it, they could pay, you, you've been in the Apple stores. Those are generally college educated kids. Some of them grow older, but they have no careers. A company like Apple, being as successful as it should, should raise the bar for employment of people like that and should be making those the best jobs you can possibly find, even if there's no ongoing career that can go beyond that job with Apple, and there are a few ways you can move up. Uh, those people should be able to go from Apple, get, uh, you know, they do find a little bit of education, but they could find a lot more. I, I wrote about this in Harvard Business Review uh, at one point. Uh, and, uh, and, and have, be the start of building careers, and it, obviously not just Apple. That needs to do that. It needs to be all these companies. Just in, if you take the U.S. economy, it's just going down. It should be looking for ways, and this is there's a precedent to this because it's always been done with the military, of of taking those resources and finding the way to use their technological capability for social purposes. And I guarantee you, if they use their technological cap capability for social purposes, there'll be innovative products that are going to produce a lot of profits in the future. It doesn't need to be Apple. They can spin off the people and money and start new firms. And, and I think that should be done, and that has been done in, in, in many cases. So you don't need to have that, the notion that you just have this control within the firm, that is problematic, but you don't need to do that. So we need to change the rules in which, uh, in which it occurs. But the fact is we can't do without these big firms uh, in, in, in many industries. And, and if they don't compete by, by having the high quality products and getting scale, they're, they're, they're gonna lose out, and you're not gonna have that capability anymore, and if you're looking at this from a national point of view, it'll disappear uh, from, from that national economy, and those jobs will disappear, and the people who, in a global labor market, the people who have those capabilities are gonna go somewhere else. So there's a lot of bigger social issues that you have to go beyond the company, and, and the people sitting on the, the board of directors have to think about this. Now, one thing, uh, when journalists ask me about this stuff, I say, well, you know, I don't know Al Gore, but go talk to Al Gore. <laughs> He's been sitting on the board of Apple since 2003, you know, one of the world's leading advocates for dealing with climate change. And here's a company that could have taken the lead uh, in uh, all kinds of ways in funding uh, investment that de deals with climate change, looking at this uh, from a social point of view. And it would be perfectly legitimate if we had a different ideology about the firm and recognize that these shareholders are just people who buy and sell shares. And the reason that Apple's doing this, by the way, is I'm quite sure is because of the Carl Icons in the world and, and others who are, who, who are threatening, if they don't do this, they'll come in and just loot the company on, on their own behalf. And so, so it's, 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 it's a, there's a fundamental set of institutional changes that did occur and obviously get down into the way that these companies operate. Uh, you can deal with any of these. Uh, I just want to mention one thing. It's true that obviously you should never say anything is definitive in social sciences, but telecom operators can be innovative. Because uh, I come from, well, I work now in France. <laughs> so in France, we have the wonderful example of the Minitel. And that was followed uh, 20 years later in Japan by Docomo developing uh, the iMode. So it's not impossible. <laughs> they can be innovative. Depends on the area. We're saying about the consumer reaching, and we can look at the data, they are, they are fairly sanguine. Uh, what I'm saying is that innovation happens outside the boundaries of these traditional firms. And I think that it might be useful, especially for you looking at ecosystems, to consider it. And some of the firms, the very same firms that you were mentioning, have CDCs that support their ecosystem partners, or others are funding them. So perhaps we want to put that in the context. But uh, well, you, are you talking about service, I mean, in this particular industry, service providers. But if you, I mean, Huawei or Cisco in the 90s, or uh, any, any company that is producing the equipment. Sure. It's not done it by, by capital expenditure, they've done it by massive research and people. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's how, they, that's how they, they learn. And they have learning organizations. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, capital expenditures is not, is not what makes those, those, those companies super innovative. Well, I think, I think the, the, I mean, I have some of the things Bill mentioned, but if I think specifically at, you know, industrial ecosystems which are still capable to reproduce themselves and being innovative and so on. There are not so many in the world, actually. There are places where big companies have been uh, spin out lots of specialist contractors and lots of small companies. The small companies don't come from 
generally in these places just from startups, but actually they come from the big companies themselves, which for a long period of time have been, at least I'm thinking about few medical device or biopharma industries in the context of Northern Italy, which was used in the 80s and 90s to talk about a sort of third Italy model. Many of these companies were actually coming out from the big companies which were trying to create an ecosystem around them, which is still persist and still deliver the type of innovativeness that you had across a number of players who are actually doing that sort of division of labor in both in the innovation process and manufacturing process and so on. So I think that is something that in the context we were with Maria the Air show uh, just a couple of weeks ago, 10 days ago, last week, I remember, uh, and talking with some of the people in the industry uh, about what has been happening in the aerospace industry in the context of the UK, along all the supply chain. And one of the interesting comments which came out was, well, you know, when the demand started declining, well, we have started, we have been, in, in, you know, sort of pushed towards some form of lateral migration, but where do you go if the automotive industry is also declining and if other industries of the type they could actually tap in actually are not, not doing well. So that is the issue around you know, how financialization cannot be just a problem for one single big company, but actually for the broader uh, system as a well. whole. And just to come back to your point about your, very briefly, I don't think that this is a new thing. I mean, now students are talking about uh, being pushing, especially in the economics department, mainstream economics department, to rethink economics and try there are movements across I was actually in South Africa just to also bring in other parts of the world uh, where students are actually asking exactly these questions. The standard way in which economics has been taught for many, many years uh, is actually, first of all, creating ignorant economists, completely illiterate. I mean, the fact that the theorem of sentence has been now mentioned, but you know, that, you know, you go in any of the economics department, they will barely know the wealth of nation or will barely know any classical political economists, right? So there is a problem of creating people incapable to engage with their own discipline and I'm capable to understand the extent to which these ideas might be uh, you know, cyclically re-entering in, you know, in, the, in the understanding of reality. Um, many of the things we discussed, uh, you know, if really put in context, would allow us to understand, for example, uh, what is the current discussion in the trade wars between uh, China and between the US, or how the UK is positioning in the context of Brexit. We go back to the Enlightenment and the discussion between Adam Smith or Hume, and on the other end, uh, list and how the US was positioning against the UK at that time were actually quite similar. So in a sense, we had a discipline which requires this continuous engagement between ideas and history and context, uh, which is not anymore taught. So that is a limitation in terms of, I agree with you, there are certain ideas that might navigate across time. There are some others which are wrong because they are foundationally uh, analytically poor in terms of understanding productive organization and understanding that, that context. And if I would just finish, I mean, this morning, John Kay was mentioning, well, we should push our students or economists themselves of, as a student of the economy in going out and visiting companies. Um, probably business schools are a bit better, slightly better than economic departments, but economic departments, I, I challenge you to find anyone who spent any time in going outside and seeing what is the reality of the economy. Can I just answer this? Please. Uh, being a card-carrying economist, who's taught at London Business School and Dean of the Business School, you've gone really too far. Mm. I mean, I don't think you understand what right. modern economics is right. or how it's taught. And so I think maybe you should visit the economics departments at LSE and UCL. I think you've just gone too far. I, I'm sorry about that. But I, I did want to uh, ask uh, Steve Denny a question. Uh, going back to Peter Drucker, if you looked at the world of voters, who are the customers, right? Politicians depend on voters. So what would Peter say about the political system given what the voters are now demanding? Well, well it's, a, it's a whole other session, but uh, <laughs> I, there is an, obviously a, an analogy, but I think that they're, they're different worlds and there are analogies between them. But uh, I mean, the political world, I think, is become disrupted by very divisive forces, particularly in the US, where I, which I know better, um, and in a way that isn't characterized in the business world. The business world is a different sort of problem where you have firms saying, well, I'll just go on exploiting, innovation is too difficult, I'll just extract the value, and not realizing that, in fact, that <coughs> isn't an option anymore. If you just continue to exploit your existing model, 
change or die, you're going to die. And you might decide to die and get rich in the meantime. But that's a very different thing from the political world where you have these very divisive uh, movements and where uh, gr different groups don't talk to each other, don't understand, don't want to listen to each other. It's a very different world from the commercial world. I actually have a quote on that from Peter Drucker, okay? Today it has become possible, if not commonplace in this country, to assert the business enterprise must be so managed to make the public good become the private good of the enterprise. In this lies the real meaning of the American Revolution of the 20th century, that more and more of our managements claim it to be their responsibility to realize this new principle in their daily action is our best hope for the future of our country and society, and perhaps for the future of Western society altogether. To make certain that this assertion does not remain lip service, but becomes hard fact, is the most important, the ultimate responsibility of management to itself, to the enterprise, to our heritage, to our society, and to our way of life. Peter Drucker got this, but he was, he was taken over by Milton Friedman. I wish more, I mean, I, I wish he weren't just a management guru. I wish he had been like an economist where he would be respected a little bit more. Yeah, well, some people respect him who are economists. Yeah, that's right. that's right. <laughs> I'm for one. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, Okay, I think we actually reached, that's a good point to end on as we reach our overtime. But thank you very much. It's been very good. <laughs>